Hey there! You know, nature is awesome. Have you ever played the game Pikmin before? It's a game in which a man crashes into a foreign planet and finds a strange species that's half animal, half plant. Not only that, but there are different colors of Pikmin. Each has its own ability. Red survives fire, yellow electricity, blue breathes underwater, and the list adds up to seven types total. Well, the concept is pretty far-fetched, but could Pikmin actually exist? Now, before we look at the half-plant, half-animal signs of the Pikmin, let's look at the different abilities of the Pikmin. Can any species really have the abilities that the Pikmin have? Well, let's look at the different Pikmin. Now, four of the Pikmin have traits that we see every day and know are possible, like purple Pikmin being heavier, pink have wings, Rock Pikmin have hard shells, and white are poisonous, so we won't worry about them. Now the other Pikmin, red, yellow, and blue, all seem to have abilities that are fictional, but are they really? Well, what about red Pikmin? Could any living organism really survive in a fire? Well, fire varies between temperatures of 1100 and 5600 degrees Fahrenheit. A candle is usually 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, but natural gases, excuse you, come in at about 5000 degrees Fahrenheit. The hottest flames we see in the game, though, are most likely caused by methane gas and holes in the ground, in the form of a fire geyser. A similar occurrence is found in Washington State. In the early 1900s, miners drilled into a pocket of methane gas that they used to power their equipment. By the 1920s, it was turned into a park where the pocket was ignited, turning it into a fire geyser. Methane gas creates a flame of 5,090 degrees Fahrenheit, meaning that the red Pikmin would have to be able to survive these temperatures. But has anything on our planet been known to do that? For the longest time, it was thought that the salamander could survive in and even extinguish flames. Dating back to 300 BC, a claim made by Aristotle that extended up to medieval times. It was believed that salamanders were born out of fire and had special powers that allowed them to survive in it. Even Leonardo da Vinci claimed that the salamander had no digestive organs but only eats fire to survive. The idea formed when people would make fires from logs and salamanders came rushing out as the fire burned, giving the idea that they were born from the fire. Well, what really was happening was that the salamanders, like many amphibians, were taking shelter in rotting logs against predators. When people would take the logs and burn them in the fire, the salamanders would come running out to escape the fire, looking as if they were actually being born from it. But, sadly, this isn't true either. The tardigrades, or water bear, is a creature that can survive temperatures at 300 degrees Fahrenheit. They're only one millimeter small and is the toughest creature known to man. It can also survive negative 457 degrees Fahrenheit, 5,700 degrees of radiation, and even the vacuum pressures of space. This ability is amazing, but it still wouldn't be enough to survive campfires at temperatures of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, let alone methane gas at 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and not to mention that the flower on their head wouldn't stand a chance. Sadly, red Pikmin is just a myth. Now the blue Pikmin are strange because they walk on land like the other Pikmin, except they can breathe underwater. Alamar describes the blue Pikmin as amphibious, surviving both in water and on land, and resembling gills on their cheeks. Well, this is what Alamar observes, but I believe he's wrong. Well, at least some of what he says is wrong. Before I can explain what I mean, we need to understand how gills and lungs work so we can know if something can actually breathe in air and water. In our lungs, air passes through the bronchial tube and into the alveoli. The walls of the alveoli is covered in small blood vessels called capillaries. These blood vessels are so small and thin that they allow the oxygen in the air to pass through them and enter your blood. Now, gills work essentially the same way. Fish take in water from their mouth and lead it to the gills. The gills are coated with a mass amount of cells called epithelium cells grouped together to connect to the arteries. The high surface area of the cells on the gills causes most of the dissolved oxygen in the water to diffuse into the arteries. So, can a creature have both? Well, there's the Australian lungfish, which is a fish that can actually breathe air. They have an organ called the swim bladder, which most fish use for buoyancy. However, the lungfish can use it to breathe air. It's filled with small cavities with fine blood vessels that can take in oxygen from the air. If the water has plenty of oxygen, then they'll just use their gills. But if levels become too low, they have to swim to the surface to take in air. Well, this is pretty cool, but the lungfish can't actually breathe in water forever, and at some point, we'll have to come up for air. Well, is there a species that has lungs but can also breathe in the water? Well, this is where Olimar was right. The blue Pikmin are definitely amphibians, living in both water and land, like frogs. Amphibians are born with gills, but as they mature into adults, they lose their gills and grow lungs. So, if they lose their gills, how do they breathe underwater? Well, in addition to lungs, they have thin skin with a network of blood vessels and capillaries under it. In a process called cutaneous respiration, oxygen can be pulled in through the skin and go directly into their bloodstream. This is where I think Alamar is wrong. 
The Pikmin don't have gills at all. They just breathe through their skin like amphibians. So as far as blue Pikmin go, it makes complete sense that a subspecies of Pikmin could exist in our world. How cool is that? Now the hardest subspecies of Pikmin to prove is going to be the yellow Pikmin. Can any organism really survive an electrical shock? Well, electricity may not kill you in the way you think it does. Electricity is made of several units. Voltage, which is the pressure it moves at. Amperage, which is the amount of electrons moving per second. And ohms, the amount of resistance on the current. One amp is six million trillion electrons per second. But it would only take seven milliamps to the heart to kill you. The heart has already sent frequent electric signals to cause it to beat in a regular pattern. But the electricity from the shock confuses the heart into pumping very irregularly or fibrillate. She's been electrocuted. Clear? However, 7 milliamps couldn't reach your heart if you touched it because of the body's resistance. So, for the electricity to actually reach your heart and kill you, you'd have to touch over 100 milliamps for over 3 seconds. But that's just in humans though. So is there an animal in the real world that's unaffected by electricity? The first animal you'd probably think of is the electric eel. They can strike their prey with electricity and not get shocked themselves. So clearly they're invincible to electricity, right? Well, not really. See, the electric eel has an organ in its tail that generates a small shock in each cell with the help of a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. Each cell only releases 130 millivolts, but are arranged so closely together that when all 5,000 of them release at once, it produces a combined voltage of 650 volts. The reason it isn't shocked itself is because the shock only lasts for about 2 milliseconds, and with each cell only releasing a small current, it barely has any effect on the area it came from. So really, the ill isn't electric proof. It could be killed just as easily as any other animal if it passed through an electric current. So the question is, how does the yellow Pikmin survive an electrical shock? Well, they'd obviously have to have an incredibly high amount of resistance. Resistance is how difficult it is for electricity to move through a certain material. If it can't reach its heart, then it's safe, right? Well, is there a material that can resist the electricity found in the game? Well, the voltage in electricity actually determines how much pressure the current is moving at. The higher the voltage is, the easier it can flow through the material, which would make even highly resistant materials break at a certain voltage. This is called a material's dielectric strength. So the yellow Pikmin would need a coating that has a dielectric strength higher than the voltage in the game. Well, since they can survive every electrical attack in the game, we would only need to look at the one that produces the most voltage. The lowest would actually come from wires, since most only produce 120 volts. However, the strongest electric current the yellow Pikmin have been seen to survive is lightning in the multiplayer game Bingo Battle in Pikmin 3. A lightning bolt can strike anywhere between 100 million to a couple billion volts of electricity. Dielectric strength is measured in how many kilovolts it can resist per inch. However, the yellow Pikmin's outer covering would be a lot thinner than an inch. So how do we figure out how thick it is? Well, according to Nintendo, Pikmin are 2.9 centimeters tall, or 268 pixels. Their stomach width is 81 pixels, which would make it 0.88 centimeters wide, or 8.8 millimeters. So let's say at most the outer layer of Pikmin is about 4% of its waist, at about 3 pixels, which is fair when looking at the arms, any more wouldn't leave room for internal arteries or veins. So those 3 pixels translate to 0.33 millimeters or 0.013 inches. So this means that in order for the Pikmin to survive a lightning strike, its outer covering would have to have a dielectric strength of over 1 billion volts per 0.013 inches, or about 76 billion volts per inch. One of the highest dielectric strengths we know of is 5 million volts per inch coming from mica, a silicate mineral. Rubber only comes in at 700,000 volts per inch, which is the only reasonable sounding coating the Pikmin could produce since some plants produce latex, which is used to make rubber. The fact is, yellow Pikmin just can't exist in our world. So now that we know which Pikmin can or can't exist, we just need to know, can Pikmin exist in general? Can an organism be both plant and animal at the same time? And how do the Pikmin grow that flower out of their head? Well, maybe they're not part plant at all. Maybe they're just home to some parasitic plant growing out of their head. Oftentimes, algae will grow on the skin of whales, but algae doesn't grow flowers, so that's probably not it. Plus, we see the Pikmin are born from seeds in the ground. Well, okay, then they must truly be part plant, right? But how can an organism be both plant and animal at the same time? Well, let's take a look at our own world and see if something similar exists. The solar sea slug has scientists stumped. It feeds on algae for food, but certain slugs have done something strange. They digest most of the algae, 
but steal the plastids for themselves. Plastids are sac-like organelles from plant cells that hold chloroplast, which produce a green pigment called chlorophyll, which is what gives the plants their color. When chlorophyll is hit by sunlight, it converts the energy into sugars for the cell to use through a process called photosynthesis. The sea slug was able to use the stolen plastids to form a green layer on its back and go through photosynthesis. It could go months without ever digesting food because of this. How crazy is that? An animal that steals organelles from a plant and uses it for itself? Well, as crazy as it is, we still don't see a flower growing out of the sea slug, so perhaps the Pikmin just ate enough of them until they became flowers? Eh, well, we have no way of proving that in our own world, so where else can we look? Maybe the Pikmin didn't actually do this to themselves. Could we genetically engineer plant DNA and animal DNA together? Well, all DNA is made up of four nucleobases, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. And when arranged in different sequences, they determine what an organism is made of. The smallest changes in DNA can determine small features like color of hair or petals, but the combinations of larger patterns decide whether an organism will have skin or leaves. These larger traits are made up of thousands of combinations of genes, making it incredibly difficult to know which combinations code these traits. But can we still transfer these genes between animals and plants? As of today, the only animal genes we've genetically engineered into plants are very small changes, such as growth hormones from carp into safflower to produce pharmaceutical proteins, fungal resistance from chicken to wheat, or genes from the Norwegian rats to change the oil profile in soybeans. However, it's important to understand that there's no such thing as animal DNA or plant DNA. Genes are just genes, whether it's in a plant or an animal. It's when you combine thousands of these genes together in a complex pattern that determines if an organism is a plant or an animal. So could we one day in the far future understand these patterns enough to create an animal-plant hybrid? Probably not. When it comes to complex patterns of DNA, they begin to only accept certain genetic programs and will reject any that won't fit into its process. For instance, scientists can successfully genetically enhance fruit flies to grow more eyes on its wings, but they couldn't make it grow antlers from a deer. The genetic pattern for antlers just can't fit within a fruit fly's DNA, exactly why insects can't grow flowers from their head. As of today, it just isn't possible. Wait, as of today? What, what year is Pikmin set in? Oh, wait, we couldn't know that because it's on a foreign planet. Or is it? In the game, we see a ton of random objects, such as a Duracell battery, a Dr. Pepper bottle cap, and a Game & Watch video game. These are clearly objects from planet Earth. There's no such thing as no man's land to me. Not only that, but Alamar actually says the planet is full of oxygen, just like our planet. The Pikmin world is actually Earth. So how do we figure out what year we're set in? Well, if we look at the planet from the spaceship in Pikmin 3, we can see that the land is all positioned very closely together. This land mocks almost exactly the model for what scientists believe the Earth will look like in 250 million years from now. Despite whether they're wrong or right about this, it's clear that Nintendo was basing Pikmin off of this model, making Pikmin 250 million years in the future. Is it possible that by this time, mankind has such an understanding of science that they really can create an animal plant species? Well, there's no way to know for sure. So, even though you can't buy your own pet Pikmin right now, perhaps one day, we will.